welcome to part two of this bumper episode of The Whiteout. We've got loads to talk about, so let's crack on. So we're gonna head over to fellow Olympian, Ed Drake, who's gonna take us through all of the latest news and tell us what's going on in 2021. Thank you, Emily. This season is going to be a little bit different. Um, COVID has curtailed some of the racing and the calendar is looking a little bit different this season, but we are still getting racing. And what you'll see on the TV will be the same as always. So they've cut some of the races. They've tried to keep the both uh, men and women and also the speed side and the tech side separate so that they're not having too much intermingling. So that means that we will still get the big races, we will still be heading to Kitzbühel, we'll still be heading to Adelboden and the likes of those races, but it does mean that we won't see any crowds at all this season, which is going to be a bit of a shame. They won't be able to keep the crowds off there totally, so if you've got a lift pass, you'll still be able to get to the sides, but there just won't be any stadium skiing, which will be a bit of a shame. But we have kicked off already this season with Solden, which was a couple of weeks ago. We saw the women race on the 18th. They kicked off the, the season and then the men race on the 19th. Marta Bassina of Italy picked up her second World Cup win of her career. Uh, Brignoni, who is the overall champion from the 2019-2020 season, picked up second and Petra Vlahova picked up third. She went from 10th uh, on the first run to ending up third on the second. So she had an absolute stormer. On the men's side, we saw Lucas Branton, who is a Norwegian young gun. It's the first time he's ever podiumed and he went straight to the top step uh, with a fantastic second run. The uh, second position was picked up by Marco Odemat, former world junior champion. He finished just 500s behind in second. And Gino Caviezel, also a first time uh, position on the podium, rounded it off with a third place. Uh, on a British front, we saw Alex Tilly pick up 27th. She had a really, really good weekend but she just managed to make a mistake right at the crucial part where you don't want to, off the steep, onto the flat, which meant she was carrying quite a lot of less speed through that final section. But all in all, she did kick off with some good skiing, so it's promising signs for her going forward. As we're recording this, uh, we have Levy double women's slalom this coming weekend, which is the 21st and 22nd. So if you've missed that, make sure you catch up. You can see it uh, anywhere online. You can catch up on the uh, Ski Racing podcast. We have all the information on there. And also coming up, which is gonna be a super exciting race, is a parallel giant slalom in Lech, Austria. Uh, both the women and the men are racing. So it's a parallel giant slalom, not normal giant slalom like you'd see on the World Cup. They've, uh, the radius is slightly shorter and the distance between the gates is also shorter, which means we should have some exciting racing. That is gonna be on the 26th and 27th. From a British perspective this season, Dave Riding is looking in great form. He's uh, switched back to Fisher skis. He's sounding very comfortable. He's looking forward to this coming winter. January is gonna be an absolute belter if you're a fan of slalom. There are nine slaloms in January to get your head around. Charlie Raposo races in the giant slaloms. He's already had a crack already this season in um, Solden but uh, didn't make the second run, but his chance is looking good for this coming season. And on the ladies' front, we both got Charlie Guest and Alex Tilly, who will be competing in slalom and giant slalom. So hopefully it's gonna be a bumper season for the Brits. Okay, so I think I covered everything. That was a bit, quite a lot of information to get through, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it is definitely going to be a really interesting season this year. Ed and I were on the team together, and this is actually really bizarre being sitting behind a table talking about it rather than yeah. going out and training. So uh, yeah, it's quite nice that way though. I like it. Um, so what do you think, Ed? Like I was thinking as an athlete, going into kind of a, an Olympic year next year when it's kind of Olympic quality and stuff like that. What, what do you, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's going to be really difficult. They can already start qualifying for the Olympic Games as of the start of this season. So that's definitely going to be in the athletes' minds. I think it's really difficult not knowing if the goalposts are going to be moved in terms of when we're actually going to get the Olympic Games. I think signs are that it should happen as planned, yeah. but obviously 
none of us have got a crystal ball. Well, I know, and I think that's the difficult thing because as an athlete, you're just really focused on, on goals yeah. and you work all these little steps up yeah, to this exactly. ultimate goal and you've, you, there might be shorter goals in sight, but kind of not knowing if that, that might change and the goalpost might change, like you say, is it, always a little bit scary. So the athletes have almost got to change their mindset completely and be a little bit flexible. Um, and also, you know, with... <laughs> It's a pretty stressful time, Olympic yeah. criteria and hitting all those games. And a lot of competitions have already been cancelled and changed and postponed and things like that. So, yeah, it's... I think it means that you're going to have to really perform all the time yeah. because you can't just look at the backstop of whenever qualification sort of end date is because you don't know what the period preceding that's going to look like. So the fact is that a cliche of sport, but every race is going to count. Every single moment you put on the skis, whether it's in a you know, World Cup, Europa Cup, even a fizz race now, you're going to have to make sure that every single time you race, you're putting your best foot forward because you don't know what's going to happen around the corner. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we've got 22 Olympics, which I do think are going to go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but the exciting thing for me is the fact that in 2026, it's coming back to Europe, which has, has been quite a key point because it being kind of over in kind of China and Pyeongchang over in Korea and stuff it was it was you felt a little bit disconnected to it it's going to be it's going to be a different feel and we haven't been in Europe for the game since Turin I believe in the Winter Olympic side certainly yeah. that means sort of the the classic continental Europeans live for the Olympics and I think when we've gone further afield their focus isn't necessarily on Winter Olympics. Yes. So to have them back in Europe, I think the fanfare is going to be amazing. We're going to have loads more uh, insight from experts yeah. and the fans are just going to get so behind it. I absolutely can't wait. Yeah. And I kind of wish that I, it was I, awesome. wish that I could <laughs> I do it. Yeah, because you were in Canada, I was over in Korea. The time zones are always so difficult, yeah. but to actually have that kind of like in Europe, it's it's almost yeah. like having an, a home Olympics, isn't it? Well, as it? close to home as we're going to get. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and Cortina, is already put like all the steps in place to kind of like make to bring it home almost yeah. and all that heritage with the skiing they have there and stuff they've they're already thinking about all the plans of how it's going to affect the future of their skiing as well yeah well, and with the world champs this coming february that's a, a big hurdle that they've got to get through and obviously with corona we, it means that that's got a slight sort of a shadow over whether that's going to happen but fizz Fizz's focus for the 2020-2021 season, if you can <laughs> say that quickly better than I am, um, then you are, you know, that's their main focus. And if they don't get, if nothing else happens this season other than that, it's going to be a success for Fizz this season. Talking about Cortina and looking ahead to the future. Now, this is something which makes me feel pretty old. We're moving forward to the future um, talent of Britain and we caught up a few of our athletes. Hi, my name is Molly Butler and I'm 14 years old. For half of the year, well nearly half, I live in the UK, in Surrey, and for the other half I live in Megève, in the French Alps. I represent two different clubs, so for the French I represent Ski Club Saint-Gervais and for the English I represent BSA, British Ski Academy. Um, I have different coaches, I have my mum and my dad and I have Emma Carrick Anderson and Phil Smith, who have their three boys, who are some of my best friends. Typical ski training day for me. During the summer, I could be waking up at the early hours of 4 a.m. And during the winter, from maybe six to eight. I can train from three to six hours a day. My best results in races last year, I took the title home of English champion. At the very end of the season, I was in Morzine and I took the title of French champion home, which I was really, really, really happy with. And that was actually my last race of the season because Corona cut it short. I really want to get down a course at the end of the year, every single time, and just think to myself, wow, that's a crack and run. I couldn't have done any better. I'm really pleased with that. It's not just the skiing and the racing and the adrenaline rush that I get. It's also the lifestyle, being in the mountains, having a gorgeous scenery around you. It's really, it's really like touching to the heart. Thoughts are getting to the 2026 Winter Olympics in Cortina. Quite a big thought. Um, God, I love it. I try to focus more on the now moment because I find that if you're focusing on the now moment, then you're really, really fully focused on everything that you're doing instead of everything that's yet to come. But obviously it's a long-term goal. Can't wait to put all the effort in to get there. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hi, my name's Luca Carrick-Smith and I'm 15 years old. 
I live in a small village, say, in the Alps. At the moment, I represent Great Britain, but I've got two clubs. Um, Villa Roger, which enables me to race in the French races, and BSA, my British club, to race in the British races. My name is Zach Harry Smith, I'm 13 years old. A typical training day would be, um, usually we wake up at 6am, maybe get skiing at 8am, ski all morning, and probably do some training in the afternoon. I love skiing because it's, um, it's my life, it's always has been, and I just, just love skiing. Yeah. I'm definitely most proud of um, the Coq d'Or, which is the French Championships, which I won um, last year. That's my best result so far. My name is Freddie Calc Smith and I'm 13 years old. Well, I think that it's very possible to get to the um, Olympics in 2026, but I think that it's going to be very tight. My favourite ski resort is um, Satsui because the snow is brilliant. Um, there's loads of World Cup ski races that ski there and it's just a really nice glacier to ski on. Hi, my name is Reese Bell. I am 19 years old and I live in Vail, Colorado and in Denver, Colorado. I race with the University of Denver ski team and for the Great Britain national team. My typical day of training begins in Denver and then we head up to Loveland Resort where we train for around two hours and then drive back to campus. The drives are pretty long, so I generally do homework. And then in the afternoon, I attend my classes and some of the days I will do another smaller workout, such as lifting or riding the spin bike. My best race result points wise happened last year uh, at a college invitational race. It is challenging to set goals for this season because I'm not exactly sure what the season will look like with COVID-19, but I hope to get my GS skiing to the same level or close to the same level as my slalom skiing and just to lower my points in both events. I love skiing because it's a really great way to find like a mindfulness with everything going on in your life. It can get really busy and it can be hard to stay focused on one thing. The 2026 um, Winter Olympic Games in Cortina are six years away and it would be amazing if I could qualify for that. Um, I have a lot of time to raise my skiing to the level that I need and I just think it would be a huge milestone for me and for all the people who have helped me out along the way. My favorite ski resort would have to be either anywhere in the Alps or Big Sky Montana because uh, Big Sky has really amazing free skiing that is also accessible by the lift and by ski patrol. It does take me back a little bit though. I mean, all those fun times on those trips at that age. I know, you just don't realise how much of a good time it is until, until you're too old. <laughs> <laughs> so Ed, thanks so much for coming. But where can we find out all the info on ski racing? Yeah, you can keep up to date on the ski racing podcast and that we produce stuff every week on the World Cup and keep up to date there. We all know that having the right insurance is essential when we're going on our ski holiday, arguably now more than ever. But it is quite confusing when you get all of that jargon and all the technicalities when it comes to actually getting the right insurance. Luckily, I've got Michael Pettifer here from MPI Brokers, and you are basically the ski specialist insurance for the UK. So I've got a few questions here, which are going to help yep. us and our audience. So we just need to know, kind of firstly, what exactly we need when it comes to winter insurance. Well, the winter insurance for skiing is the important thing is to identify that you're buying a skiers policy, which is designed for skiers. And of course, in the coming winter, uh, you'll be looking to see whether COVID is insured. Uh, and the important bit there is that medical expenses is covered when abroad, um, which at MPI we do cover, provided there's no FCDO warning against orbital central travel, which is common throughout the market. You can travel under our policy with a warning, but you're just not insured for the reason for the warning, in this case at the moment, COVID. You've lost me a little bit there. FCO warning, I'm hearing this a lot at the moment. So if I'm wanting to go skiing, um, Am I covered or am I not? 
If there's a warning in place, which there currently is for most of Europe, yeah. from the FCDO, uh, with most policies, you can't travel at all. You're not insured at all for anything. Uh, some of them, and MPI is one, will, ins will cover you to, to travel under that warning, other than the reason for the warning. So what you're saying there is if I went skiing and broke my leg, I would be covered, but if I went and I contracted COVID-19, I wouldn't be insured. That is absolutely correct. Okay, so Michael, that is the situation right now. Is that going to be the same throughout the whole of the winter season? Or could that change, you know, from date to date? It is a movable feast, as we know. Uh, the, the, the advice being given by governments and, uh, and, uh, and other authorities is changing almost daily. Uh, yes, it probably will change throughout the winter. If things improve, obviously the insurance cover will, will improve with it. So it's always kind of sensible, kind of if you were to pick up that insurance kind of next week, that we always kind of revisit and speak to the experts like yourself at MPI to kind of get the correct information for that time of travel. Absolutely correct. So we've been following these travel restrictions kind of all summer and stuff. So if those travel advice kind of changes within the winter season, how would that affect kind of my cover? Back to that situation we talked about earlier, my broken leg is covered if I contracted COVID-19. If, if the, if the uh, when, let's hope, the warning is removed, so there is no comment from the FCO, then it's back to normal. So cover is there. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to look at kind of people who are going for their season, you know, so you're 18, 19, you're going for your, uh, your season uh, trip. Um, how does kind of the, that kind of insurance affect? Because they're going to be there for a long period. How, how does your insurance cover for your season airs? Well, the, season, the season airs is simply a, a, a longer period. The main difference between that and a, a, a normal tourist policy is the premium. Uh, it's higher because they're out there longer. So they, they select a period that suits the period that the, the time they're going to be out there. Yes. So it's just a change of the time period, but the same things we've just been speaking about before with it going in and out of the travel advice and stuff would still that all apply. remain all nothing, the same. Nothing changes. Yeah, it's all, all the same. Um, you know, speaking to someone like me, I do like to go off piste and I do like to do stupid things like ski cross but not everyone does that however kind of for those people who do like to kind of uh, raise their heart rate a little bit and get off piste and stuff what how does the cover change then um normally it's some insurances say just for on piste how, how what would we need to look for if we were going to go off piste uh, look for a policy that covers off piste preferably with no restrictions on uh, who you who you ski with uh, quite quite a lot of them will require you to ski with a a guide, okay. a mountain guide. At MPR we've been insuring people for, for decades um, and when I first started in this business there were no, well there, there were pistes but not, not as much as there are today. So you expected a ski policy to cover you to ski off piste as we do now with no restrictions. What's the most common mistakes people do when they're purchasing their ski insurance? The first one, do you want that one? They, yeah. don't, they, don't, they don't buy it. They don't they insure, they go... forget. Uh, if they're booking with a travel company, they're potentially in breach of the terms and conditions of their travel company. Again, that's their choice. Uh, but there are those that forget, and we, we find them ringing up from the airport, on the transfer bus on the way out. The other one that people make a mistake on is not to book their travel insurance, their ski insurance, at the time of when they book the trip. Yeah. That is really important because uh, you're incurring a liability, the customer is incurring a liability uh, for the cost of the trip. And uh, should, uh, heaven forbid, something happen between booking and date of travel, which can be anything up to three, four, five months, and you hurt yourself playing hockey, or you have a car accident, or you fall sick, uh, and you can't go, and it could be several thousand pounds, and you haven't bought your insurance, uh, then you're on your own. The other thing, thing people do is then buy it at the last minute. When I say last minute, then last minute before they go to see the doctor. And that causes trouble. Can you actually purchase your travel insurance if you are in a foreign country or do you have to be in the UK to purchase? Strictly speaking, you have to be in the UK and uh, to a large extent the, the, the travel insurance industry do stipulate that that is the case. Um, there are some like us that you can buy from abroad. We have structures in place where that is allowed. 
Okay, yeah. so there is, if you have yeah. accidentally forgotten, yeah. there still is that ability that to ability go out there and get there. Yeah. When it comes to kind of geographical, um, do you need a different insurance for Europe as to the US or Canada? Kind of is, is there different insurances out there or do, is it one fits? No, it's, it's, a, it's the same policy. It just makes sure when you buy uh, that you click the right button. <laughs> it'll say worldwide or it will say USA, Canada. Uh, and if you click Europe, you're covered to do Europe. Now, after the 31st of December, are we Europe <laughs> or do we have to click worldwide? No, it no, no, I'm no, no, to? it's Europe. It'll still be Europe. Okie dokes. <laughs> whether, whether the premiums go up because of the lack of the EHIC, the European Health Insurance Card, yeah. uh, we don't know yet. Okay. The deal has not yet done. Okay, so would it be smart to get my travel insurance if I'm thinking about yes. going away now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Because that premium... <laughs> is fixed. Oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah, it won't change once you bought. Well, For new business after the 1st of January, it might change. We don't know yet. So we've talked about the individual. What about when we're travelling with a family and actual children for insurance? How does it work with them? Do I need to get them their own separate policy or are there policies which include them all? No, you can buy a policy which uh, most, most providers will have a family click, click button. Uh, if not, when you put the ages of, of the family and children in, it'll automatically give you a family policy. Uh, and the main difference is in the premium rating, which is usually behind the scenes. You, you won't necessarily be able to work it out. But they yeah. have this exactly yeah. the same cover. They have exactly as the same the cover, yeah. One, one thing on that, if children are traveling, or being insured, should I say, independently of, of their parents, uh, there are a lot of policies out there that won't do it. Okay. it do come to MPI, because we do. So that's really interesting about the kids, because obviously I used to do a lot of that racing on my own and my parents were never around. So it's, it's great that there is a policy which I can be, you can be independently as a child yeah. um, and covered. Now, I just want to touch upon um, someone who might be going out for the season, because uh, there might be the seasoners who are going out, it might be the kids racing. But also now that we can work from home yeah. and we can potentially work from the mountains, there might be some people who are considering going in and, and moving, working from home out in the mountains, living the dream. Um, so extended c cover, what, what do you say about that? Well, we call that long stay, okay. which is basically uh, exactly the same as the season airs, right. but it tends to be that they, they're not working in a bar, uh, they're, they're working doing their, their office work which would normally be in, 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 the, in, city, in, in the city or, or, or Surrey or Sussex and they just move themselves to Val or, or, or to Teen or wherever uh, and they can do exactly the same uh, and if the lift's open they can go off and do some skiing. So if you want to find out any more information you can go to mpibrokers.com or you can just pick up the phone and Michael's team will be able to help you out. He's the guru of Ski insurance for the UK. So thank you so much for coming, Michael, and helping me out, <laughs> increasing my knowledge on the subject. Um, but yeah, I hopefully will see you out in the mountains and uh, yeah, be getting that insurance. Hopefully, thank you very much indeed. Now, we might not be able to hit the slopes just yet, but this is a perfect opportunity to update our ski gear. One thing I'm personally looking forward to if to, after many years of racing and wearing the most uncomfortable, tightest boots because it's all about the precision is that I can now wear ski boots which actually feel like slippers. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's a revolutionary for me. Uh, it's true, Emily. You know, ski boots do not have to be uncomfortable unless you're a ski racer, of course. Uh, but for most, most skiers, there's so many things can now be done in the store. And so we sent one of our team, Henry Druce, down to one of our favorite local ski stores, Finches, to see how they actually fit and custom fit every boot to each, each customer so they get the perfect fit on a, for, for a skier. My trusty old ski boots have skied their last run. I need a new pair, the most crucial bit of kit you can buy. Get it right and you're en route to on-slope happiness. Get it wrong and a world of pain and discomfort awaits. And that's why I'm here in South East London at specialist ski shop Finches. It's like a giant sweet shop for snow sports fans. The most important person to steer you towards comfort and joy is your boot fitter. Let's go and meet Finches specialist boot fitter, Bradley Finch. 
So Bradley, what is the first stage in the process? Um, so generally we ask a few questions to the customer, um, like their ability level, try and gauge where they're happy at, um, also things like their budget and stuff like that, and we measure the foot. Um, we have a look at the foot and, and look at things like pronation and supination, which is basically whether your foot stands neutral or rolls in or rolls out. Um, we do things like shell fits, so we we'll actually put your foot into the plastic shell and have a look around there, make sure there's nothing touching, no bone spurs or any previous injuries that may be giving you any issues for further skiing down the line. And why should I get my boots fitted here rather than anywhere else? We try our hardest to listen to our customers um, and you know everything they have to say is important. Um, we're not super duper strict, we're not trying to get you into a World Cup race boot. Um, we want you to be comfortable on the hill, unless you want a World Cup race boot. Um, and yeah, we do things like our comfort guarantee, um, which is we basically any physical augmentation we do to the boot, so expanding shells, um, stuff like that, grinding, um, it's all free of charge after you purchase the boot um, and that's also kind of like over a duration of time so you can go out skiing you can go to places like the snow dome um, have a play in the boots come back to us and we can tweak things um, and that's over kind of a fairly long period so, of time. so it's, it's up to five years is that correct? up to five years yeah yeah i mean if, hopefully we'll get it sorted way before then but yeah you, you can take all that up to five years if you need so I guess the next thing we need to do is uh, find a pair of boots. Yeah, cool. So we've taken the measurements around 26, 26 and a half. Um, what I've got here is a pair of Salomon S Pro 130s. Um, this is more of the kind of higher range, um, higher level set of boots here for a good skier. And also we've got some intermediate um, Hawk Prime uh, 100s, um, which are kind of like a nice, most of my customers will go for like a 100 flex boot. Um, that's my bread and butter at the moment. How many boots would you normally pull out for a customer? Um, we try and keep it to a minimal, really. We don't want to kind of overwhelm you with loads of boots. We have quite a, a wide range here. So by taking the measurements and having the talking, well, asking the questions that we um, we did previously, um, we can narrow it down to three to four sets of boots, generally speaking. So you're going to be able to find something for everyone. Definitely, definitely. So what's going on here? So at the moment, this machine will be pumping hot air into the boot, um, helping the liners to become soft and expand ever so slightly. Um, so when we put your feet inside them, they'll just take a nice shape of your foot. So we've got the inner boot sorted, and now we're doing the shell. Yeah, so this oven goes up to about 120 degrees, um, puts a bit of heat inside the, the shell itself, um, and that will allow the shell to actually flex around your foot if needs be. So whilst it's heating, um, we can go down and start doing your custom footbeds if you wish. Yes, please. Cool, follow me. So what exactly are we doing here, Bradley? So what we're doing here is actually making a bespoke custom footbed um, for your ski boots to help you kind of stand neutral and also just give you comfort um, and like I said before, good support. Um, we end up with something like this, which we can put into any ski boot, your own ski boot that you're buying now, or even an old pair of boots you've had for, for many years, you just want to give a fresh lease of life. It's taken an hour and I've now got my new custom fitted boots. I can't wait to try them out on the slopes, hopefully in a month's time. So during lockdown, many of us had to transition and start to work from home. So we were no longer chained to that city desk. In fact, kind of the term working from home, could that be if we have the Wi-Fi and we have the internet connection, could we work from anywhere? I mean, we all have that little dream of having that chalet on the ski slopes where we could do our day job, but equally enjoy that amazing environment and get to ski every day. Oh, it's the ultimate scenario, isn't it, Emily? Um, but, you know, we actually caught up with Terrasons. They're a property developer in the French Alps. And uh, Megan uh, interviewed James Ross, who's the MD of Terrasons, to ask him how possible it actually is 
to invest in Alpine property and then actually live the dream and spend some time there. So could living the dream become the actual reality? Let's see. It's a nice thought. Hi, James. How are you? Hi, Megan. Very well. And you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Strange times, but keeping yeah. well. Um, yeah, so indeed. Terrasons, tell us a little bit about what it is you guys do. Terrason as a group, uh, we were set up in uh, 2008 um, as, a, as a developer and, uh, of luxury uh, alpine uh, ski property. Along with developing, we also manage and look after our, our own property. So if you want the property to be rented uh, and looked after for you, that, that's what we do. So with everything going on at the moment, I mean, is this a good time to buy in the Alps? Sure. Well, I guess it's never really a bad time, but um, we have seen a lot of people who have been waiting for that dreaded B word, which I'm not going to mention, uh, but it's been sort of, you know, four and a half years now. And I think a lot of people are feel more confident with, with where it's going. So that has given people confidence to, to go and buy a dream for a lot of people. It's a 10, 20, 30 year program for them. COVID for sure has played its own role in that, uh, where people think, well, you know, do we want to have our own sort of bolt hole in the Alps so we can escape to? So how simple is it to actually purchase property in the Alps? I mean, I guess there's always trepidation in, in doing anything, uh, especially, you know, large purchases in, in another country. Um, but that's very much where, where we come in with a developer, with a managing agent. And, um, you know, the UK operation was set up to really look after the UK and international clients um, from the very beginning. So, you know, the partnership starts with us. Uh, from the first initial phone call right through to purchasing the property, changing the plans around if that's what you want, and then uh, managing and renting the property out for you. So, you know, these are long-term partnerships. And in terms of um, how easy it is, so we provide tried and tested uh, mortgage brokers have been working with for years, fully vetted, no tears to be your legal representative in France. Uh, so, you know, that whole process, is you're not going to do it on your own. We're very much there the whole way. So what would the key things to consider be for someone that's thinking about potentially buying a property in the Alps? Well, it's, you know, location, where you want to be. Um, and if you're looking to have the property uh, as an investment, which, which most people do. Uh, so we always build in, uh, in really sort of good, solid resorts where the investment can be there for strong rental and, and, and capital growth over, over the long term. So pick a resort that's going to be somewhere you know your investment will continue, basically. Absolutely, yeah. Another thing uh, you need to think about uh, when purchasing a property is, is mortgages. Um, so, um, you know, what sort of mortgage are, are you looking for? At the moment in France, rates are, are, are terrific. And, and the difference with the UK and France is you can lock that rate in for the duration of the mortgage. That can really be quite attractive. So it's a good time to buy. Uh, absolutely. Taking families on holiday... Uh, to the Alps a couple of times a year can be very expensive. Financially, this, this can be very beneficial. Most of our clients um, want it to pay for itself. And, and you know, wh why wouldn't you? And that's really changed in the last, say, you know, five years. And I mean, you've, you've pretty much kind of answered this next question already in the sense of making life so easy for people. But, you know, why is it so important to go through such a reliable company as yourselves? You know, it's no secret. There are horror stories throughout throughout you know, even Europe, where uh, people have, you know, been burnt. What we offer is to have no third parties. We do absolutely everything and, and you know, hold our client's hand all, all, all the way. Are you seeing a little bit more of a demand for people actually thinking, I don't really need to be in London or Manchester or wherever they're based. I could do the same job I'm doing. No, yeah, absolutely right. It's, it, that has very much changed during, during COVID. Um, we've very much seen a, a, a new type of client who who is looking for a, a, a bolt hole in the Alps where they can work for, for, for extended periods of time. We also know that having a very strong uh, a broadband connection within the development is important. We've actually even created a couple of uh, apartments within our developments that, that have uh, offices in them. I've heard it's even possible to claim the VAT back when you purchase a property in France. So essentially what, what you're doing to get the VAT back is you're commercialising the property. So you're pushing it up for, for rental and, and management. The French government likes that because you're helping the local economy, you're having warm beds. So essentially what they're saying is, um, you know, thanks for um, you know, buying the property, commercializing it, and, and we're going to reward you uh, and give you the 20% VAT 
back as a rebate um, for doing that. Um, and finally, I mean, is there anywhere that you would recommend as a sort of a must buy area at the moment? You know, do you have any insider tips? We're seeing a, a model for people who, who want to be closer to airports. We have a development in, uh, in Combalu, uh, which is near Majed, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, and that's just an hour from uh, Geneva Airport. And that's very much geared up for families. Um, so there's a kids club there, a lovely indoor and outdoor pool. It's, it's skiing, ski out through this magic carpet we've created. Um, and also in the summer, it's got a, a lovely lake there with views of, of Mont Blanc. So, so that is really something which is quite special for those who, who have families who don't want to travel too far. Uh, but have everything uh, once you're there. And we're launching two new developments in Switzerland, which is, uh, again, another new uh, string to our bow, if you like. And we've never been in Switzerland before, uh, but these are really uh, going to be something quite special. So, Rob and Emily, there you go. There's some tips and advice for you if you're looking to buy your next place in the mountains. And um, thank you very much for chatting to us, James. It was a pleasure. So this winter, people's priorities might be a little bit different when it comes to their ski holidays. So I don't know about you, Rob, but one of my favourite things on ski holidays is the food. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's part of a ski holiday, isn't it? You know, eating is definitely part of one of my ski holidays. I mean, it's my part ski of holiday, my everyday it? life. I wake <laughs> up thinking about food. I'm thinking about food when I go to sleep. But yeah. OK, it's well, hard to indulge when I'm going to a ski. Holiday. I wake up thinking about skiing, uh, <laughs> but then then just eat, end up eating a lot of food. No, no, but ski holidays, it's really important, isn't it, for, for us? And uh, but this year, you know, that restaurants might, might be operating differently. Some people might not want to go into restaurants uh, this winter, but chalet operators are doing a lot to you know, change the way that they, that they bring food to their guests as well. And we caught up with Chalets 1066 and they're based in the French resort of Leger and they told us about what they're doing this winter. Thanks Rob, uh, we're here in Leger now. I'm Mark Nathan and I'm with my uh, colleague Ben. Uh, we run Chalet 1066, also with Joe and Martin from two companies we work with. I'm here to talk the sorts of choices and options you've got here in Leger. Firstly, about Chalet 1066, we've been growing our business for 12 years now. We run nearly 40 properties in Leger, from basic economy to luxury properties, from one to six bedrooms. So we've got something for everybody. But our basic philosophy is to offer customers value and choice. And the way we do that is we offer the basic self-catered accommodation and we have a range of partners that we work with to provide all the other services. But all in the knowledge that we're here in the village, we know the village, we live here. So we can make sure you have a great holiday and if anything goes wrong, we're there to help out. Firstly, I'd like to hand over to Martin. He used to work in the, at the Savoy Hotel as a chef. He now runs Bon Appetit. Hi, I'm Martin from Bon Appetit Alps, a gourmet online meal delivery service. We create a extensive international menu of about 60 different delicious dishes. There really is something for everybody. Um, you can order online before your holiday or order before 4 p.m. for the same night delivery. We are very mindful of the planet from our waste to our packaging. Um, we cut out all the faff. It is your, your holiday after all. Thanks, Martin. I have to say, we keep a stock of Martin's food in our freezer at Chalet Astings, as French would say, um, because if we're on a busy changeover day, we don't know if we're going to finish at five or midnight. And we know we've got a really good quality meal there. We can just warm up easily. So I'd now like to hand over to Joe. He worked at a number of Michelin restaurants in the UK. He's now been running his business here for eight years locally, providing really good chefs to cook meals for people on ski holidays. Hi, I'm Joe from The Chef Cellar. We are a morzine based wine wholesaler and caterer. Uh, we provide wine deliveries and catering services uh, in the area, including to Lay J. We work very closely with a local team of chefs. Uh, they're all proven to very high standard in restaurant. They may have worked on luxury boats. They may have worked at Michelin and Star Standard. They'll come into your chalet with hostesses, set up your table, make your meals, clean down everything, leave the place spotless like they've never been there. Uh, the packages start at a very reasonable 40 euros per day per person, that includes half board, so you've got your breakfast, dinner, afternoon tea, and you've even got wine included with the evening meal. For those who like the wine deliveries, that's uh, available starting at just 29 euros for a mixed case of six bottles of wine. Free delivery in Lay J, free delivery to all 1066 customers. We have over 85 wines in our cave, 
Um, a bit for every taste and every budget. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Joe. One of the great things about Joe's service is you know you're getting a highly qualified chef. And I'd like to hand over to Ben. Um, Ben's going to tell you um, a bit more about Leger and why Leger is such a great uh, uh, resort to have a ski holiday. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm the uh, resort manager here at Chalets 1066. I've got 10 seasons experience in the industry, working both as a ski instructor and resort manager. Leger is in the Port de Soleil, which is the second biggest ski area in the world. Um, it's 625 kilometres of piste on one ski pass. The actual resort Leger is divided up into two sides. You have the Chavan side and the Moncherie side. On the Chavan side, it's got a fantastic beginner area, many, many blue runs and the connection into Morzine and then the Port du Soleil. The Moncherie side, which you can see behind me now, is mostly reds and blacks. The crowds usually don't come over this side, which means on a busy week, it's fantastic. There's no, no queues, the peace are quiet, and, and because of that, the, sna the snow stays in great condition. And the town of Leger is, is, is absolutely fantastic. It has everything you need. It has many bars and restaurants, a huge spa, Outer Lumina, which is a brand new tourist attraction um, this year, the first in Europe for, with a fantastic light show and holograms. Leger is my favorite place to be, and I'm very happy to live here. Thanks, Ben. Obviously, every session like this has to have a few words about coronavirus. And my brother's a doctor, and we developed our cleaning standards in line with his recommendations. Done a lot of work, and we use very high quality, very expensive cleaning materials. Uh, finally, I just hope we uh, are able to see you in Leger. It's a great place to take a ski holiday, and it's great for any level of skier. Thanks. Now, Rob, we know you love your skis and you're going to get a little bit techie on us now, so we're just going to pop off, grab some accessories and we'll be back. Bye, girls. <laughs> I've got the K2 Mindbender 90 Ti here. K2, the last few years, they've really come up with the goods. They're, they're, they're a very innovative company, they always have been, but I think the last couple of years, they've brought out some new skis, including the Mindbender range, that have really taken the whole ski world by storm. Uh, this one here, the 90 underfoot, 90 mil underfoot version, the Mindbender, it's, it's a free ride ski, but it's an all mountain free ride. So if you're the kind of skier that loves to ski on piste and off piste when the conditions are right, this is the kind of one ski does it all that you might be looking for. 90 underfoot, so very responsive on piste. It's also got a titanal uh, metal plate that runs through the ski. And they call this the Y beam because it looks like an actual Y shape. So it's not in the middle of the ski here. It's just on either side. Also, um, on the tail of the ski as well. And what that does, it just, it just gives that torsional stiffness, but at the same time, with the torsional stiffness, also a lot of res response as well. So it makes it easier to ski, but also keeps that really, really good grip on, on hard packed snow. I have skied on this, on this one. Um, it is a very powerful ski. I think it would suit someone that is, is quite a sort of an aggressive skier and, and, and wants to really charge you know, on and off piste. So this is the K2 Mindbender 90 Ti. It's available from Ellis Brigham and Snow Tracks in the UK. So I'm now gonna grab another ski. This is the K2 Disruption. It's brand new for this winter season. It's 700 pounds retail. It looks absolutely fantastic. Again, you know, K2 have redesigned and rethought their entire piece range. And this Disruption looks really slick. I haven't had the chance to ski on this one yet. I'm really looking forward to doing that this winter. Um, but you know, what K2 are saying is that it's a, it's a high performance ski for the piste. And it's got a dampening system, a new dampening system in the ski that really makes the performance, you know, that, that sort of high end performance, but also doesn't add weight to the ski. They've done that in quite a clever way. They've done that with carbon uh, inside the ski that's wedged between uh, the layers of the ski, uh, but in a slightly different way to, that's, to how that's been done before. So this is called the Dark Matter Damping System. And if you want all the tech on it, check it out on K2's website. It is really, really impressive. This is the K2 Disruption MTI. It retails for 700 pounds and it's available from Ellis Brigham and Snow Tracks. There's also a woman's version of the ski available called the Disruption MTI Alliance. Same price, 700 pounds, and also available from Ellis Brigham and Snow Tracks. So I've got the new Armada Declivity ski here. It's a 540 pound retail price, available from Ellis Brigham. 
It's a real classic all mountain front side free ride ski and, and great on piste as well. Tightenal banding that runs through the ski, that means that torsionally it's really, it's nice and stiff, you know, making, making that grip on hard packed snow easier to control. Um, but it's, it screams sort of all mountain, this ski to me. Uh, it, looks, it looks fantastic. It's nice and light. Um, it's got a, an AR100 uh, sidewall on there and it's got Armada's comp series base on as well. So yeah, if you're looking for an all mountain free ride ski, the sees 92 millimeters underfoot uh, for a good price point, then I, I think the Armada declivity looks, looks really interesting. I've got a new ski here from Armada, it's called the Stranger. It's 100 mil underfoot. It's kind of like a free ride, freestyle ski. It looks like so much fun. It's the kind of ski that, you know, if you want to hit the groomers all day long, they've designed it so it's really grippy on piste. You know, those groomers are just going to suck it all up. But obviously if the power comes, uh, you can get out there with that 100 mil underfoot and have a lot of fun. You can see there's like a twin rocker on there as well. So tip and tail, so it's got that kind of freestyle element to it. So it's a lot of fun. You could probably take it in the park, you know, and, and have a real good play on the ski. So yeah, 540 pounds available from Absolute Snow and it's The Stranger from Armada, 100 mil underfoot. So I think Megan and Emily are gonna join me again. Where are they? Oh, they're, hi, oh, you're back again. We Got are. rid of the skis now. We are with some more gadgets. Ah, brilliant. I mean, I'll kick us off because this will definitely come in handy if you're thinking about purchasing any of the skis Rob was just talking about. I mean, if you're anything like me and you lose things all the time, even skis can get lost. I'm just gonna throw it out there. You can be at an Apro bar, you know, and you it see that there's hundreds and hundreds of pairs of skis. And actually, when you stop and think about it, you think it's a bit ridiculous that you can pay three or four hundred pounds for a pair of skis and then just actually just leave them on the floor. Yeah. Um, so something like a ski lock is essential, really, if you're thinking about protecting your skis when you're on the mountains. This one is one of our favourites. You can fit the skis through the middle there and then you can even put the poles in because a lot of ski locks, they don't attach the poles as well. So okay. even though you've locked up your skis, your poles are still yep. sort of just left to do their own thing. Whereas this actually includes the poles in the ski lock. You just wrap it around and clip it in and your skis and your poles will be secure. It's nice and light as well, isn't it? I mean, it, that would fit into, your, into a ski jacket pocket. Oh, definitely. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, if you had a backpack, easily into the backpack, but it would actually go into your pocket. And it is a pretty sensible thing if you own a pair of skis, you know, to, to, to lock them up. So that's the Ski Security Ski Lock, and it's available at skilock.co.uk, and it's about 29.99. So for the price of protecting an expensive pair of skis, definitely worth it, in my opinion. Yeah, good little, little stocking filler there. Um, now, let me show you this. Um, I'm quite a fan of this, because I'm one of those people who, I'm never very good at travel, packing light, but this is kind of like one of those bags, which is it's 45 litres, but it still fits kind of like within the cabin, um, which is really cool. It's actually the Dekine or the Dekine, which w we could argue about this all day, but it's the Ranger travel pack. Um, the beauty thing about this, I've actually kind of like pulled out one of the straps here, but everything actually kind of goes inside as well. So it's really kind of like, you don't get any of those, those your straps or anything, yeah, you don't get anything stuck. And you're actually, it's a backpack, but they're kind of hidden in this back pocket as well. Um, great thing about it, obviously, kind of if you're going away on your ski trip, even if you like long weekend, whatever it might be, you can get all of your kit kind of in there, but there's kind of pouches for the city as well. So it's got kind of your, your laptop pouch and stuff like that. Um, but you've got your water pouch here and there's, there's also another pouch inside, which essentially you could, you could, it could be for your probe and your shovel if needed, but it's not not a specific like backcountry backpack, so you could use it but you that, could like, so, kind of yeah, use it for that big, that kind of thing meters, as well. Yeah, it's pouches. It's got so many pouches, and um, yeah, just it's like really durable material, really good solid zips. How much does that retail for? So it's actually about 139 euros, and you can get it from the dekine-shop.com. Good to know. <laughs> so I've got a Ski Mojo here. Uh, ski Mojo, it's a device that is literally worn by thousands of skiers these days. It's a pretty well-known product, but there has been an evolution of Ski Mojo over the last couple of years. They've actually developed this new harness system. So if you're wearing a Ski Mojo that's maybe two or three years old, you probably don't have the same system as this. This is making it easier to get on and off. Basically, you can wear this harness, put it on in the morning, and then you can clip the Ski Mojo on after that. Now this is 
So that's pretty good in my eyes because the other one was actually quite cumbersome. Sometimes and it's hard to get on. People were having to wear them like over ski trousers and stuff like that because it was right. maybe a little bit large. So that is a bit of a game changer in my it eyes. It is. It is a game changer. I mean, you don't. You know, the, the thing is with this, you don't see people that are wearing ski mojos because they do wear them generally underneath yes. their ski pants. And you might need a slightly baggier ski pant, but actually they go under most ski pants. The thing, the way it works, the hy hydraulic spring here or a spring system. Um, at the moment, the spring's not set. But you know, when you put it on, you, you click a, a little switch, yeah. and the, the spring kicks in, and it just supports your entire you know um, lower part of the body, yeah. um, and it, it really works incredibly well. So essential was saying it's kind of a suspension system, which you kind of attach to your knee. So yep. I've kind of like had I think I've had four surgeries now on my knee, so I kind of yeah. know that skiing can kind of take its toll on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this kind of thing. I think in years to come might be one of my best mates. <laughs> oh no, I mean me too. You know, my you know knees knees are tricky things, and when when you've skied for you know a long time, they 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 do take a pounding. So many people that I know that use this product, yep. they said they wouldn't be able to ski unless they had a ski mojo. They literally really? wouldn't be able to do it. So I actually it tried it myself. I've not had knee problems. Yeah. I'm quite lucky in that regard. But I tested it out just to kind of see what it was like, yeah. and I could not believe the difference. Genuinely, I didn't think it would really make that much of a difference for me, but it seriously did. It really changes the way you can ski. You can do a lot more. Absolutely. You can sort it gives of, you a lot of power. Yeah, you can push a lot harder than you are used to. Yeah, sure. So I really liked it, and I now recommend it to anyone that actually has. I mean, there is an argument to say, you know, even if you don't have an knee injury, uh, you could use a ski mojo to, to enhance the way that you turn and the yeah. power that it gives you in those turns. You can really feel that. That yeah, force no, through like the. It. Yeah, no, I, I know. It <laughs> is, it is incredible. I took it off and I was un unhappy. But everyone from pro skiers uh, use it. You know, I know Shemi Alcott uses it uh, sometimes for herself as well. Uh, obviously, she's had knee surgery too. And but just but just ordinary skiers who who need to to help themselves and, and maybe you know they've been skiing a long time and and they need a bit of assistance. Um, it's retails for fi around five hundred pounds uh, from SkiMojo.com. But yeah, it, it's it's a great device, and it de it definitely keeps a lot of people out there on the slopes that might not be skiing if they didn't have one. Well, we can't have a gear guide without a pair of gloves. Can be arguably the most important accessory you're going to have if you go on the ski slopes this winter. So, these are the Dekine Maverick Gore-Tex. Retail for 52 quid, 52 pounds, which I think for a Gore-Tex glove like this with with a, a leather palm as well uh, and outer is 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 really good. Uh, they look great. They're a little bit large for me. This is a size large. They're a bit smaller. I might have stuck them in my back pocket, but I'm not going to get away with that. But they do feel really, really nice. And you know when you get those new gloves and sometimes they're a little bit, they're a bit stiff like that. Not at all with these. They're just really, I could, you know, they're really, really nice and flexible. So, you know, waterproof and breathable Gore-Tex gloves. Warm? Well, I would imagine they're really warm. They feel warm. I certainly feel warm. Obviously hard to tell in here, uh, but they, they just feel like they're, they're going to be a warm, uh, breathable and waterproof glove. And of course, breathability is so important in gloves. It keeps your hands uh, warm because if they get wet, that's when they get cold. So yeah, you can get this from the Dekeen, these from the Dekeen, or Dekeen website, uh, £52. Definitely a good investment, I would say, if you're going skiing this winter. So if you do want any more inspiration on any gear or want to read up further on anything we've talked about today, just head to inthesnow.com. We've got a huge gear guide on there and you'll be browsing for hours, I'm sure. So to celebrate this bumper edition, we have also got some competitions for you. Yeah, we've got some great prizes. Uh, we've got two return tickets with Euro Tunnel, uh, so you can drive to the Alps. That's a great prize. Uh, we've got ski jacket from Cortazo, the brand uh, that we can, you can see in our gear guide. Really nice jacket. Um, we've got the Aluna Coconut Rum as well, which is a great prize. And we've got a prize for a holiday in Cromontana. Montana. Nice. So if you want to enter any of those competitions, just head across to inthesnow.com forward slash competitions and you can enter there. So Emily, we were supposed to be out in the mountains filming this show, but obviously we're not. We're here in the UK, but I'm going to make you a little cocktail, something that reminds me of Val d'Isere. Thunder Toffee Vodka, because that's where it's from. So I'm going to make this cocktail. I've got a recipe here. I've never made this one before, but it looks really, really easy. OK. Shall I give it a go? Yeah, yeah. All right. So I've got a cocktail shaker. Here we go. Thunder Toffee Vodka. 
Looks, looks good. I've got 50, millime 50 milliliters that I'm going to put into this uh, cocktail shaker here. Have you got a measurer? No. <laughs> <laughs> got it off your truck. So, Let's see your 50, 50 look, milliliters. 50 milliliters. There you go. Yep, perfect. Half the bottle. Perfect. Okay, that's 50 milliliters of that. That's our 50 and then milliliters. I've got some apple schnapps here. I'm going to put 25 milliliters of apple schnapps. Yep, that into looks there. like a nice, there generous 25. Yeah, okay. And then uh, some fresh apple juice. I've got that here 25 milliliters of fresh apple juice. Just a little bit of a pour there. Stick that in. That's about 25 milliliters. Yep. Certainly. There's definitely more toffee vodka in there than the, uh, than the apple juice. And a little squirt, 12 millilitres of lemon juice. Yeah, that's a little, a little squirt of lemon juice there. Um, and of course, it says here, shake well. So shaken, not stirred. Make sure we a little bit of a... I've got two prepared glasses here. For oh, you, nice. Emily. There's one. It's going all over the place. <laughs> I hope there's no electrics around here. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, come on. Isn't this just a great way to end our filming day, Emily? A little bit of a toffee vodka. Yeah, I think right. I got the measurements just right. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but hey, Rob, you know I'm not. I'm pretty competitive, so we're uh, actually, uh, I thought I'd bring something along to oh, yeah? compete with it, yeah. Oh, wow, that so, looks impressive. Uh, I've actually got a coconut hot chocolate for us to try. A coconut Ooh. rum hot chocolate. Oh. oh, even better. Yeah, so it's an Aluna coconut rum. Just to tell you what it is, it's a sublime blend of smooth rums from Guatemala and the Caribbean with an all-natural toasted coconut flavours. Mm, sounds lovely. And pure coconut water. But basically, with this hot chocolate, it's working pretty well. Oh yeah? So just, yeah. Ooh. Give you a little, a little go. Oh, thank you. you. A lunar coconut. I mean, just think of this in your hip flask or when you're on the mountains, or even if you're in the UK, you can bring a little bit of ski into your living room, have a little hot chocolate with coconut It smells chocolatey and coconutty. Well, enough. that's the two mixes, that's pretty good. Oh, that's nice. Oh, it's very warming as well, oh, isn't like it? I like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that might be my new uh, drink of choice on the mountain. So on that note, Rob, I think that's time for us to sign out off for today. We'll be back with the next episode of The Whiteout. Rob's going to wear, get tucked into that toffee vodka. And you're going to get tucked into that Aluna coconut rum. Cheers. Cheers.